All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to lecture 13 of CS287. Um, last week on Thursday, there was no live lecture, but we actually did cover the material. So Ignacy did a uh, recording at home uh, and posted a video on Piazza so you can watch lecture 12 uh, on video. There will be no live version of that lecture. Um, but this way we can keep up with the course and not lose a lecture slot. Um, today, lecture 13, we'll look at Kalman Smoother's maximum posteriori estimation, maximum likelihood, and expectation maximization. All right, so this is our menu for today. Let's start with uh, smoothing. What's the main idea behind smoothing? Let's go back to filtering, which we've been doing. In filtering, what you have is you try to find a distribution over a variable xt after you have observed some sensory measurements z0 through zt. And um, ideally, over time, you keep track of this. When you go to the next time, you again find a distribution for xt plus 1, given all observations up to time t plus 1, and repeat. Now, if you look at this very asymmetric, you only use information from the past. And often, that's indeed the best you can do, because right now, you need to know the state of the robot as well as possible. So the best you can do is filtering in that situation. But what if you're post-processing your data? You already collected your data and want to know where was my robot back at time t. You should also use the information that happened after. And so that's called smoothing. In smoothing, you use all the sensor observations before and after to come to a conclusion about the distribution over state of your robot or your environment. Now, in the figures I drew here, uh, I ignored the actions. Um, and in principle, it could be action everywhere for every time slice, but it does not change the math in any way. What does the action do? The only thing the action does, if we're doing estimation, is that the conditional distribution of xt plus 1 given xt becomes conditional xt plus 1 given xt and the action. But once the action is fixed, because you have the whole sequence, it's just indexing into a conditional distribution and putting it there indexed by the action. And so let's assume that already happened. We already have a conditional distribution for xt given xt minus 1. And maybe it was indexed by the action. Maybe there was no actions. It doesn't really matter. The math is the same. All right. So as we think about smoothing and compare it to filtering, um, let's work out the basics on the board. So we'll do this by example. Rather than having a you know, just very general like any kind of horizon problem, we'll pick a very specific horizon, just horizon 2. So we'll be interested in, um, let me put this up. We'll be interested in the probability distribution over state at time 2. So that's our example. In general, it would be any time t, but we're going to do by example for time 2, given observations at time 0, 1, and 2. Now, one thing we know is that this is proportional to the joint distribution over x2 and the observations z0, z1, z2. Again, what does this sign mean? The proportional sign, what it means is that we're looking at a distribution over x2. And what it means is that we can evaluate this quantity here for all values of x2. And once we have all the numbers for every possible value of x2, we can just sum those together, divide by that sum, and that will normalize it, make this sum to 1, and get the actual conditional. Now, the model we have is this HMM-like model. So how do we write out this thing over here? It's equal to the sum over variables we have ignored, because we have a chain in how the probability distribution is set up. And we left out x0 and x1. But as we write out the joint distribution, they'll appear in it. So we'll sum out over x0 and x1. And then we can write out the full uh, chain rule for this HMM, there is z2 given x2. Before that, there was x2 given x1. Then with that, there was right before that z1 given x1. And then before that, there was x1 given x0. And before that, there was 
z0 given x0, and then distribution for x0. And the graph corresponding to this is x0, let's do capitals x0, x1, x2, and then observed z0, c1, z2. So we just wrote out the full joint over all six variables here, but then we only care about these four, so we sum out over x0 and x1 to get the distribution over just the four we care about. Now, what do we do in filtering? Well, we can actually start looking at some uh, reorganization here. x0, where does it appear? x0 only appears at the end here. So as we look at this summation, we can actually move it. We can say, this is really x0 summation can happen in the back here. So sum over x0, p x1 given x0, p0 given x0, p x0. Because as far as x0 is concerned, everything up front is a constant. And bringing up a constant up front is fine to do. Uh, that's essentially saying multiplying every term with a constant or first summing it all together and then multiplying with a constant is the same thing. Then how about x1? x1 does not appear in here, so we can bring this up front. So we can bring p z2 given x2 up front, and then we have the summation over x1, and then this one does have x1 in it, and so does this one. And then this one, after we sum out over x0, will have x1 and z0 in it. z0 is a constant, but x1 will be in it, so we have to keep it in the back behind this summation. Now let's give these some meaning in how we would actually run the filtering algorithm. We'd say, OK, this thing here is actually the joint. It's the joint between z0, well, let's write x first, joint between x0 and z0. Then we multiply with x1 given x0, and we sum out over x0. We've seen this last week. This will give us the joint between x1 and z0. Then we multiply with z1 given x1. So multiply with this conditional. At this point, we have z1 comma x1 comma z0. Then we multiply with x2 given x1. So here we'd have p x2 comma z1 comma x1 comma z0. Then we sum out over x1 so it disappears. So after here we have p x2 comma z2 comma, sorry, z1 comma z1 z0. And then here we multiply z2 given x2. So at this point we have p z2 comma x2 comma z1 comma z0, which is indeed um, what we have over here. And so what we see is that we can recursively compute the joint distribution between the latest state variable x2 and all past observations. And the calculation we do is pretty much the same every time. We just multiply in an observation, then we multiply in the dynamics model and sum over the past variable. Then we multiply in the next observation, multiply in dynamics, sum out over the past state variable, and repeat. So we have a general recursive approach to finding these things. And let's see where we're going to put this. Um, let me put it over here. We have p x t plus 1 comma z0 through z t is equal to sum over x t, the dynamics model x t plus 1 given x t times x t comma z0 through z t. And then to bring in that last observation, z t plus 1, which is ultimately what we want here for that update. Now we have z0 through zt and zt plus 1 is going to be multiplying this thing with the conditional of observation given uh, everything else. So p z t plus 1 given x t plus 1 times what we have here, p 
x t plus 1 comma z0 through zt. Now, these update equations are very easy to run, and that's all you need to do to run filtering. As a quick reminder, when we go from the joint, so here we have the joint between xt plus 1 and z0 through zt, and here we have added on zt plus 1. In general, we need to multiply with the conditional of zt plus 1, given all the variables already present here, not just this one variable. We need to multiply with the new variable condition on all variables you already have. But in this model, we have a conditional independence. We don't need to condition on the past observations if we have the current state. And so that's why we just have xt plus 1 here and not xt plus 1 and all observations to condition on. Because once we know xt plus 1, those past observations uh, don't need to be conditioned on anymore. They're independent of zt plus 1. And that's shown in the graph structure here when we're looking at we're getting z2 given everything in the past is the same thing as z2 just given x2. And that's exactly what's happening here, why we only condition on the xt plus 1. So that's filtering, and we covered that. But we covered it now in a different way than last time, slightly a different way, so we can now match up smoothing with what we saw here in filtering. I'm going to have to use a slightly smaller font for this example. Um, actually, what a Hmm, how much smaller? Um, burn this in your memories. I'll use the entire width of the board as needed um, to cover uh, smoothing. So you got this, and we'll use the full width. So smoothing, now we care about, let me draw out here the context. We will have x2 again. And after it, there will actually be x3 and x4. And there will be observations, z4, z3, z2. And actually, there will be things before it also, x1, x0 and observations z1, z0. Now we're interested in the distribution for x2 given all observations. This is something you can do after the fact, after the fact analysis. What happened to my system now that I have all the information available? So the quantity we're after is p x2 given z0, z1, z2, z3, z4. Now again, we know this is proportional to the joint between all these variables, x2 comma z0, z1, z2, z3, z4. Now, we don't directly have this kind of joint available. What we have available here is something of the form that involves all of these variables. So all the conditionals multiplied together in that graph over there is what we have available. And then some variables we're not going to care about. x0, x1, x3, and x4 we don't care about. We'll write out a full joint over all 10 variables and then sum out the four variables we don't care about. So what's the full joint? The full joint would be z4, given x4, that's happening all the way at the end. Then x4 given x3. Then z3 given x3. x3 given x2. z2 given x2. And then we'll continue on this other board. Um, x2 given x1, z1 given x1, x1 given x0, z0 given x0, and then the prior px0. This is the full joint. Now for this full joint, we know we don't care about x0, x1, x3, and x4, so we're going to sum them out to get rid of them. x0, x1, 
x3, x4, we sum out over to get this quantity over here. All right, now we're going to play the same trick. Is there, when we sum out over these variables, is there a way to rearrange this into smaller calculations? We don't need to first multiply everything together and then finally get the sum out, but we can do smaller bite size calculations where we sum some variables out, make them disappear, and that way not have this exponential blow up as the thing becomes bigger. Because if you do it naively this way, um, this summation, if the variables are binary, let's say, then there will be two to the horizon number of terms in this summation, but by bringing them in in the right spots, you reduce this and you get a linear computation in the length of the net network rather than an exponential calculation. So can we do the same thing here? Well, let's see. How about x0? Actually, we can play the same trick as before. x0, instead of summing over it over here, where does it appear? Only in the back here. So let's just insert that summation over here. How about x1? All of these are constants as far as x1 is concerned. So we can put the summation over x1 over here and get rid of it over here. Then, um, as we think of this thing here, so we have this calculation happening as a first calculation. And then after that, we can do this calculation which we know from filtering, this is giving us um, the quantities we saw in filtering, because everything happening here is what we did in filtering. We know what those quantities are going to be. Um, then, how about these here? What can we reorganize here to make this, the summations kind of move in? Well, um, it's going to be similar to what we have happening here x0 is the furthest out in the chain, and so it gets on the most inner side. Same thing will be true for x4. That's the furthest away. So we're actually going to be able to first look at x4 and say we're just going to sum over x4. Let's, let's forget about x3 for now. We'll need to squeeze it in there. But we'll sum over x4. So we're left with summation over x4. And we can actually just do this part. There's no x4 anywhere else. The result of that will be something that does involve x3, because as we sum out x4, z's are constants, but there's still an x3 in here. So we need to put on the outside still a summation over x3. It's still in there. And multiply in every appearance of x3, this one, this one. And so we have this thing over here. Now, let's look at the quantities we have after we group things this way. So let's start again over here. What do we get? Um, if we look at this quantity over here, we looked at it in filtering. This is computing p x1 comma z0 comma z1. Simple recursive calculation. Then we look at this one over here. This quantity here. We have not seen it in filtering, but we can interpret it. What is Z, Z4 given X4, X4 given X3? This is really then Z4 comma X4 given X3 is what we have over here. Then we sum over X4. So we sum out X4. So we end up with here is P Z4. X4 is being summed out given X3. All right. Now, as we keep processing this, um, and this will in the future call a backward message b x3. x3 is the variable. Then once we multiply in z3 given x3, what do we, what do we get? We get. Actually, we multiply and multiple things. So we multiply in this one, z3 given x3, which would give us p z3 comma z4 given x3, if we go up to here. Then we multiply x3 given x2, which will make it multiplying x3 given x2 brings x3 to the front, p x3 z3 z4 given x2. Then we sum out x3. And we're left with p 
z3, z4, given x2. So from one side of the chain, we get the probability of the evidence that comes after x2, given x2, that's living here. Over here, we have the join between x1, z0, z1. But actually, we can multiply in this thing and sum out over x1. So we'll get p x2, comma, z0, z1. So we have the joint of x2 with the past evidence. Then we have bringing in the current evidence at time 2. And we know the conditional distribution for the later evidence given x2. So if we multiply all three of these together, we get exactly this quantity over here, which is the join between x2 and all the evidences. And so key thing to observe here is that evidence that comes from the past is just a standard forward filter being run. That's shown over here. Evidence coming from the future is some kind of backwards filter running that does these updates here that work from the back of the chain back to x2 and give you a condition of all future evidence given x2. And of course, you need the evidence at the actual time to also incorporate it to get the full evidence. All right, so in terms of math that we did here, ultimately all it is is writing out the full joint distribution and moving around the summations and discovering the structure of how we can do calculations from the front and from the back to bring in to the time where we're at in a way that is not exponential in the number of variables we're considering, it's linear. Every calculation is simple, and we do one simple calculation per time slice to work our way to time two. All right, any questions about this? Then let me project in typeset LaTeX the equations we just derived by example on the board, but we're going to look at. Um, so you have this on the slides, this is what we did. Um, we did this, the whole smoothing thing. This is the full um, filter equations at the bottom. We're going to magnify them. There's a backward and a forward. We can combine them to get the local. So here's the full thing. We can run a filter forward, and we'll call those things A messages in some sense, indexed by time. So very simple set of update equations. Incorporate the dynamics model and the next observation and repeat. Then backward pass does something very similar, but works its way from the back. Um, you initialize with just uniform, because you have nothing really to go off. There's no prior at the end. You have just nothing to start from. And then you start bringing in evidence, and you just bring in the dynamics that got you there. Um, so the dynamics into the time step you were working from. But otherwise, it looks exactly the same. And once you have those, you can combine them um, to get the distribution for the variable xt jointly with all evidence at all times. Now, one thing that might come up in practice is that as you run this, the way it's shown here, even though mathematically it's the simplest way, you might run into numerical problems. Because as you compute a joint over more and more variables, the actual probability value will keep going down and down, and you might get uh, underflow, where you get numbers that are below numbers you can represent in floating point. So in practice, even though the math is kind of simple and cleanest when working with the joint, often you would renormalize as you work along. So you just say, OK, I have maybe currently my, um, this thing is really a joint with all past evidence, but I can also just renormalize it and forget about it being a joint and just say, hey, I'm just going to renormalize this and know that it's now a conditional instead of a joint. Um, what do you lose? You lose that probability. You don't know anymore the probability of all the evidence. You just have a conditional now for x2 or whatever time slice it is given everything else. If you do care about the actual value, because you want to say, was this a likely or an unlikely run that I just saw happen, then you can uh, keep track of these in log space. You can just keep track of the log probabilities instead of the actual probabilities, and that way um, avoid the underflow. All right, so 
Last thing to do if you do it this way is just a normalization. But again, as I said, for numerical reasons, often you'll be, the num you'll be doing the normalization as you work along to make sure things stay in the range that your floating point uh, is, computation is happy with. Now we can do other things. The same ideas we can use to find pairwise posteriors. For example, the posterior between xt and xt plus 1 jointly with all the evidence. From what we derived on the board, it should be clear what's going to happen here. xt and xt plus 1 sit next to each other. We're going to work our way from the front and the back towards them. And we're going to stop right before each one of them coming from each side and then multiply in the middle the conditional xt plus 1 given xt and the evidences for that time slice. In fact, one way you could mathematically think of it is just to think of it as what if we make xt and xt plus 1 one variable, as if it's one variable. We ignore that it's really two variables. Then exactly the same calculation can be done. And then when you unpack this one variable, you'll see that you'll have to introduce an xt plus 1 given xt into it because you're unpacking the details. Otherwise, it's just the same thing. So you compute these forward and backward messages. And then when you are hitting the middle point, you essentially just have the backward coming in xt plus 1, the forward coming into xt, and you're multiplying the conditional and the one uh, observation uh, conditional that you hadn't incorporated yet. Now, you might wonder why would we care about pairwise posteriors? I shall come clear later in this lecture. Um, for now, you might say, well, why would we ever care? But we'll clarify that. All right, so these are just the laws applied, um, but same as we did on the board. Oh, you might take this to the next level. A little harder to do. Um, you could do this as an exercise. Can I find the joint between xt and xt plus k, which is not a neighboring variable, with all the evidence? You can imagine that there will be definitely, again, messages coming from left and right. But you'll have to do a little bit of thinking about what you do with the stuff in the middle, because you'll have to sum over those variables in a way, but not lose xt as you work your way to xt plus k, because then you don't recover the joint. You need to keep somehow xt around. So you'll essentially do something like we did. But rather than summing out over xt, you just keep it around. And you skip the summing out over xt and keep working your way forward all the way to xt plus k. And the xt will just still be in there, because you never summed out over it. What is the common smoother? The common smoother is exactly what we just covered, applied to the situation where these probability distributions are conditional Gaussians, where conditional of xt plus 1 given xt is a linear Gaussian, and a conditional of zt given xt is a linear Gaussian. And then they're concrete. They're not just like these abstract distributions. Um, but in that specific case, you get the uh, common smoother. So you find that the math for common smoother is very similar to common filter, which Ignacy covered. Um, there'll be very similar equations happening that are really just matrix updates. You don't need to do any explicit integration, any kind of weird integrals that are hard to compute. No, there's closed forms. You just manipulate matrices, and you'll find updates for your covariance matrix and for your uh, mean. And in this case, it'll come from both sides, and then it'll come together and give you the smoothed estimate based on evidence from both sides. So, well, um, you could do it as an exercise. Uh, see if you can work through that. If you want to check if you really understood the derivations that were done in the previous lecture for the common filter, you could see if you can find the derivations for the backward pass. The forward pass will stay the same. The backward pass will be the new thing. Can you find what that looks like? Um, and if you can do that, that means you really understood how this works. Now, we can also look at the results. Imagine we run a common filter or a common smoother. Um, how well does it work? So a natural comparison would be something along the lines of, let's say I have some dynamical system, and I don't get to observe the state directly. But I get to see some observations. So I would run a Kalman filter. Um, but since I'm running an experiment, I could say, well, OK, let me actually give myself access to the state, see what it is, and see how precise my filter is. How well does it track the state? And that might be good for debugging and just understanding how well a Kalman filter could work. But then you could also do the same thing for the smoother. You could say, oh, let me also run the smoother. And what would you hope for? You'd hope for the smoother, the smoother estimate to have a mean that is closer to the real state than the filter. It doesn't always have to be closer, but on expectation, it should be closer because it brings in more information. And by bringing in more information, it should be able to do better. Where might this be most pronounced? at time 0. Because at time 0, the filter will have no information yet, but the smoother will have incorporated everything 
from the future to estimate the state at time zero. We will not be pronounced at all at the very end, because at the very end of your time sequence, the smoother and the filter use the exact same information, and they should have the same estimate. Otherwise, something funny going on. I mean, there might be some numerical things going on, but overall, they should have the same estimate, because they use the exact same information uh, to get the estimate at the last time slice. In between, you can think of it as the smoother having roughly twice as much information. I mean, it's not necessarily exact. It depends on the exact conditional probabilities. Observation. It can depend on a lot of things. But in general, you can think of it as having twice as much information, uh, especially roughly in the middle. And so you'd expect the variance to be about half, meaning that the average deviation from the real state for the smoother should be about half in terms of variance compared to the so average square deviation would be about a half compared to the filter. Well, let's take a look. Here's some MATLAB code we wrote a while back and ran this experiment. And so what we have here is a plot. We just did uh, 20 time steps. We see in solid line the state. There are two state variables. There's a, one state variable shown in blue, one state variable shown in green, two-dimensional space. And we see the state, the green variable starts at the top there, blue starts at the bottom here. Then we can look at the smoother in dotted and the filter in dashed. If we look at the estimates, um, for example, early on here we see that well, the filter really has no clue when it's just starting out and it's not really close to the state. But the smoother is very close because it has seen all the future to understand what the state might be now. Then at the very end, we see that they're very close together because that's just the way it is. Um, you might say, why is it never perfectly on the state? Why does it not at the end know the state perfectly? Maybe you've seen some things where it says a common filter will converge to the correct state. Um, that's only true if there's no noise in the system. Um, if there's no noise, then over time it'll nail the state. But because there is noise in this simulation, there's noise on the observations, noise in the dynamics, you can never perfectly know the state because you never get access to it. All you get is noisy measurements. But what you will see is that over time, the common filter will converge to a kind of fixed variance, a fixed uh, expected squared error around the state. You'll get that kind of convergence, but we won't converge to the actual state per se. Any questions about this? Yes, sir. Actually, when to use the mic. So you talked about the normalization at the very end. Um, is that trivial every in every instance, or are there certain instances in which you can't do it analytically, or it's computationally intractable? Yeah. So I would say. There's even a more general question. As we look at these uh, update equations for filter and smoother, are they tractable in general? And in general, they are not. Um, and we'll actually see approximations later this lecture where we it's not tractable because they're integrals. And the integrals you need to do numerically. And in high dimensions, you can't do it precisely because you need to populate that high dimensional space to get a reasonable approximation to your integral. You're not going to be able to do it. Or in a discrete space, if your state space is very large, um, imagine, um, I don't know, imagine a state variable has, is a vector. So x is a vector. Let's say x0 is a vector. And each entry in that x0 vector can take on, I don't know, 100 values. And maybe there's 100 entries. Now you have 100 to the 100 possible values for your state. And you can't enumerate that in this summation, because 100 to the 100 will be far too much to work with. And so. Things we'll see later this lecture is how to deal with this when I would say the equivalent of iterative LQR, when it's a nonlinear system, but maybe locally it's close to linear. And then locally you can approximate with linear Gaussians. And that's the extended common, oh no, we already covered that. That's the extended common filter, unsended common filter that you covered uh, last lecture. Then we'll cover next lecture is um, particle filters, which will essentially do sample based approximations to this entire calculation. So they'll say, I can't cover everything. Let me just run a particle filter, which is much like the sampling-based approaches to value iteration that we saw. It's the counterpart. You just sample a bunch of states, look at the value iteration update. Particle filter is the equivalent. You sample a bunch of possible states. You don't know which one's correct. You propagate them all, reweight them based on whether the evidence is compatible with them or not. And that way, you get an approximate estimate of the distribution. And so yes, absolutely, in general, these filter calculations are not uh, possible to do exactly. But in special cases, discrete small number of values a state can take on, yes, very feasible. And linear Gaussian 
distributions for a next state given current state and observation given current state, again, we can do it in closed form. Those are the only ones that are tractable. The other ones, you'll do approximations. Yes? Um, what's, what's an example Actually, let me use this. Uh, what's an example of a smoother being useful in that you want to know the posterior given future evidence? OK. Yeah, so the question is about the smoother being useful. I'm going to defer the answer to that till the second half of lecture, because we're kind of building up to where we're going to use it. And so let's see if we still have that question after lecture. But it's a very valid question, just a little bit of patience. So what we covered so far is filtering and smoothing, which returns a distribution for the marginal. What is the distribution for state at time t, given all observations or given all past observations? But sometimes we care about it something a little different. So top is filtering, middle is smoothing, bottom, you see in red, all the states are marked. We want to know what is the most likely joint across all of them. Now, typically, a joint distribution over many variables is not easy to represent. So typically, what you would do instead of trying to find the full joint over all of them, given all the evidence, you'd say, let's find the single most likely state combination over all times. So what is the single most likely path in state space that was followed based on all the observations I had? That's maximum a posteriori estimation. It's about finding the max instead of uh, the distribution. Now, we won't work through the math on the board for this one, but it is a good exercise to try it on your own. And the results are on the slides. But effectively, what you'll see happen in these slides is that instead of looking at a summation over the variables, we look at a max over the variables. And a max will interact with this whole set of equations essentially the same way as a summation would. And we'll play the exact same trick. We'll see like which factors have a dependence on, each, on the variable we're maxing over, bring that in a smaller group together, and so we'll recursively be able to calculate the max while running along the sequence. So there'll be a max that started at x0 and the observation z0. What is the x0 that's most likely, given the observation so far? But actually, we'll do a little more than that. If all we do is find the x0 that's most likely based on the observation, it's not necessarily compatible with everything that's following. So instead of just computing the most likely x0, we'll say for every x0, we're going to calculate how likely it is given the evidence we've seen so far. From there, we'll then say once we have that, we can combine that with the model for x1 given x0 and the observation for z1 given x1 to find how likely each x1 is if we match it with the best x0 for that x1. So we're essentially saying for each x1, how likely is it if I get to match it with the best, the most compatible x0. That's what lives in m1, x1. We'll do the same thing. We'll find what, how likely is each x2, assuming I get to match it with the best possible choice for x0 and x1. And so it's exactly the same thing. Instead of saying, what's the probability for some x2 value summed over x0 and x1. We're just saying if we got to pick the best x0 and x1. So we're replacing that sum with a max. Otherwise, the same thing is happening. Same for then x3 and so forth. Now, generally, this would be the update equation, just as simple as the ones we saw for filtering. But now the summation becomes a max. That's the only difference. Because we're not saying what's the probability combined over all possible values of the other variables. It's if I got to choose the best choice of value for the other variables. Now, one thing that happens when you run this at the end of the day, what you have is for the last variable, x h, capital H, at the very end, you'll say for each value that can take on, how likely is it, assuming the other ones take on the best matching. Um, but that's then all you have. So actually, you have to keep some pointers around. Whenever you do this max here, you have to keep track of for each value of x t, which value of xt minus 1 is the one that was chosen as the max? So you can work your way back along the chain, along those pointers, to find the full sequence. So the details are shown here. But essentially, very simple. It's just like the filtering operations, except that now we have, for all xt, we have to store the arg max so we remember the most compatible value for the from the previous time slice. So when at the very end we're done at capital T, 
we can see, okay, for all values of, ca of x capital T, which one is the most likely if it gets to be completed in its optimal way? You pick that one, follow from that value to what the previous value should be, previous value all the way back to the front. So a very efficient algorithm. Um, and you can do this, um, for example, in a tabular case. You can do it um, in general as long as the computation is tractable, as long as you can do that maximization. Sometimes a maximization is easier to do than an integral. So sometimes this thing is more tractable to run than doing the actual filtering because, well, maxing you can run gradient descent and maybe at least find the local maximum, whereas if you need to do an integration, you kind of have to sum over everything in the space and can be less tractable uh, very often. Now, one special case is the Kalman filter or the linear Gaussian setting. So summations become integrals, sure. Um, can't enumerate overall instantiations, but we can find solutions efficiently. We know that um, when we have, because we have multivariate Gaussians everywhere. Um, the, the crazy thing is, in some sense, that for the common filter, if you think about it, if you run your common filter, you find the mean everywhere. That sequence of means is actually also the most likely sequence. So there is no difference in a common filter between the maxima posteriori and the means that you find at every step from the, from the smoother, um, not the filter, from the smoother, because you want the most likely full sequence, so you need to account for everything. Um, why is that? Well, think about it. What if you do an exact calculation? You do an exact calculation, forget about any kind of algorithms. You say, I'm going to compute the full joint over all x's given the evidence. That's going to be a Gaussian. So you have a Gaussian over all x's given the evidence. Well, if you have a Gaussian for all x's given the evidence, what's the thing that's most likely? It's the means, all the means. And if you wonder what's the most likely for this single time slice, given all the evidence, it's also the mean for that single time slice. So it's a very special case where the means and the full correlated maximum a posteriori are actually the same. And it's because, the, I mean, big part is essentially it's a very simple distribution compared to uh, most distributions. And it happens to simplify that way. Um, an alternative you can do in situations like this often is to, in this case in particular, you can solve an optimization problem. Because essentially trying to find the set of variables that maximizes the objective, namely the log probability, some of the log probabilities of the evidences, is just a convex optimization problem. You can also find it that way. All right. So. Um, so far, we looked at estimation. We are given a model for dynamics and a model for measurements. And from that, we estimate distribution over state or max, most likely sequence over state. Second half of lecture, we'll actually start looking at how we can estimate the parameters in these distributions. We're assuming they're given to us. We're assuming we're given dynamics model. We're assuming we're given um, the observation model. In practice, you're typically not given them. You have to come up with them. By hand might be hard. More convenient might be to collect data and estimate them. And so we'll look at that in, when we restart in two minutes.
All right, let's uh, restart. So let's look at estimating some parameters. Simple example. Let's say we have a thumbtack and you want to build a probability distribution. When you throw it up and it lands on the table or on the ground, will it actually be pointing up or will it be lying on its side with the kind of needly thing pointing diagonally down? Well, what do you think? What's the probability of up or down? Probably, you know, in principle, you could think about it. First principle, say, well, the airflow around this thing, what might happen, and so forth. Uh, not going to be easy to come up with a very precise number. So, how do we get this parameter then to know probability of up versus down? Well, we can run an experiment. Imagine we do it 10 times, and with this is the results we get. We see it's um, up eight times and down twice. If that's the outcome of our experiments, then we might just say, well, probability of up is 0 0.8. And we might just work with that. Now we might say, well, um, it's too small an experiment. We need to run this for longer. Um, sure. Actually, somebody did this. And so any thoughts what the probability actually is going to be? 0 0.8. 0 0.8. You think 0 0.8? Uh, maybe. <laughs> I don't know yet. Um, we'll, have to, we'll know on the next slide. Any other guesses? Two thirds. It's very hard to know. I mean, it, it's very empirical. Um, so it turns out total up 77, total down 23. So they tossed up 10 of them every time and then looked at how many were up versus down. So yeah, 77% chance, according to this experiment, that you land the point of thing up. OK, so that might be our best model we can make for this, short of somebody collecting even more data and getting a more precise estimate of this thing. Um, but that, I mean, this is kind of a, a somewhat um, 
specifically designed scenario where it's very hard to just you know, do some first principles. But even when you do have first principles available for the dynamical system you're trying to model, often a lot of details you won't know very precisely. And so very often you'll still want to run experiments to get a more precise estimate of the dynamics model, of the sensor model that you can get from just first principles. So let's take a more general look at how this math works out and how we can generalize this to other things. So the first thing is that we said, OK, 77 up, 23 down, 77% chance. Um, that, that seems pretty reasonable. Um, but what if your distribution is more complex? What are you going to do? I mean, maybe there's no way to just do counting. So what are you going to do then? Well, the general principle, ideally we'd find a general principle that always applies. And in the case of the thumbtack experiment, still simplifies and gives us the same solution we already know. So how can we generalize this notion that we were just counting to get our best estimate? Well, there's something called likelihood. So imagine we observe. Um, 8 up, 2 down. And let's say the probability of up we call theta. Then we can say, you know, what's the probability of a sequence that we observe? May we have up, down, down, up, 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 up till the end. What's the probability of that? Well, we can write it out. If we say the probability of up is theta, then the probability of um, up, down, down, all up would be theta times 1 minus theta times 1 minus theta times theta. And this would be 7 times, 1 time, and this 2 times. And so total, we'd have theta to the 8 times 1 minus theta squared as the probability of that particular sequence happening. We'll call this the likelihood of what we saw happen if we choose a parameter vector theta. And then we could say, well, how should we choose theta? Again, we chose it by doing counts, but we're hoping to find a more general principle that will reduce the counts in this case, but in other cases still be possible to apply. So you could say, well, a more general principle would be to say, I want to find the parameter theta that maximizes this score. Because whichever theta maximizes this score is the theta that makes what I saw happen in the world more likely to happen than any other theta would have made it. So it's the best explanation of how the world works, at least the part of the world that I observed. So you can say, OK, well, what does this thing look like? You can plot this thing. Um, looks something like this. Theta will live between 0 and 1, of course, because it's a probability. And then this function, theta to 8, 1 minus theta squared, what does that look like? We have 0 0.5 over here. Um, it'll look like this. With, it turns out, the peak will be at 0 0.8. And so that's nice, because that means that the principle we intuitively thought was pretty good, which is just counting, corresponds to something more general, which is looking at the likelihood of, what, of the experiment under the parameter, and then find a parameter that maximizes the likelihood. Now, in general, plotting will not be really an option. You'll need to somehow find this thing without having to plot it. But we've covered optimization already in the class. We can look at derivatives, gradients, and find the optimum of this thing. For this very simple objective, we can just say derivative of this thing with respect to theta is equal to well, what is it? It's something like 8 theta to the power 7, 1 minus theta squared plus um, theta to the 8 times 1 minus theta, well, 2 times 1 minus theta. And then there's a minus here, so I have another negative 1 appearing here. OK, and then if the function really looks like this, I mean, the derivative is actually 0 over here and over here. So hopefully we can find um, where this is equal to 0 easily. And really, we find hopefully that it's 0 0.8. So let's see. Um, this thing equal to 0, well, there's a theta to the 7 here, a theta to the 8 over there. So 
we can rewrite this as, so we want this equal to zero, but this is equal to theta to the seven times, actually I plotted it wrong. It's like gonna go like this here. Theta to the seven times one minus theta, we can bring up front, and then there is left eight, one minus theta plus two times theta equal to zero. So we see that this thing will be equal to zero when theta is equal to zero, theta equal to one. So those are actually minima rather than maxima. They're bad places to be, but they have a derivative that's zero. And then the other thing is whenever this thing is equal to zero, which is eight minus eight theta plus two theta equal to zero. Is that working out for us? Hopefully it's working out. Oh, the minus, minus one minus, there's a minus sign lost somewhere. Minus two here, minus two theta. So I have a minus over here. And so then we have eight equals 10 theta. So theta equals 0 0.8. So we've got the three places where derivative equals zero, 0, 1, and 0 0.8. And this is, of course, the one we want. We can verify this by plotting, or we can verify by taking the second derivative at that spot and seeing uh, that it's uh, a negative second derivative, which gives us that shape. Now, this math was kind of OK. We can do it. But actually, in practice, people often prefer to do the math slightly differently. They'll say, OK, in general, we have a likelihood maybe of the type L theta equals um, theta to the power n1, how often we saw the first outcome. 1 minus theta to the n0, how often we saw outcome 0. And we can work through the same kind of math we saw over there. But instead, we can actually look at also at the log of L theta, the log likelihood, which will be log of theta to the n1, 1 minus theta to the n0 which is equal to n1 log theta plus n0 log 1 minus theta. Why is it OK to look at the log instead of the original thing? When you're trying to maximize or minimize by taking the log at every point on the function, you are doing a monotonic transformation. If something was the highest point, it'll still be the highest point for that function. If it's the lowest, it'll still be the lowest. The ordering stays the same. So it's OK to take the log. Then the derivative becomes simple because we don't have this product of stuff anymore. We have a sum of things. Because the log of a product is the sum of the logs. And we take derivatives, which is the sum of derivatives, which is simpler than this thing, where if we had many complicated terms multiplied together, they'd all like stay together in complicated ways and be a lot more hairy to work with. And we can do this thing, derivative respect to theta equal to 0 is what we want. Let's look at the derivative. So n1 times 1 over theta plus n0 times 1 over 1 minus theta, and then a negative 1 here. That equal to 0. Then we multiply in by theta and 1 minus theta. So we have n1, 1 minus theta plus, well, minus n0 theta equals 0. So now we need to reorganize this a little bit. We end up with um, n1 minus n1 theta minus n0 theta equals 0. So theta equals n1 over n0 plus n1, which is what we're hoping for, because the intuitive result we thought should be the right one. But we're covering it in a principal way that does not depend at all on a distribution of this format. You could have any kind of distribution and apply the same principle. You could say, I have a distribution as a complicated functional form, very hairy form, but I can still say this is the likelihood score under that form. Let me find the parameters that make this maximally likely. Now, this plot over here is another reason people like the logs. It simplifies the math that you do by hand. It actually also simplifies the math if you do it numerically. Because numerically, once you take um, the log, this plot, on log scale on this axis, rather than the original scale, will actually look um, more like this. So it's a nice 
uh, concave shape with a single optimum, there's not this weird curvature happening where you also, because this tends to be difficult to optimize with, you don't have that show up, it's much nicer behaved. And so by taking the log, you get something numerically easier to work with, just as well as often analytically easier to work with. We always talked about convex problems, um, which are problems shaped like this, and uh, those are easy to minimize. Well, these are concave problems in this case. They're easy to maximize. The same thing, same algorithms can be applied, guaranteed to find the one maximum that exists for this thing. There was a question there? Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, uh, how intuitive, intuitively, how can you see the com like concave uh, feature of this mapping? Um, so intuitive, yeah. So. It's always, a, I mean, if you take a class in convex optimization, you'll see that you know, half of the class is dedicated to building intuition on how you eyeball something's convex or not. And same thing with concave, I mean, it's the same kind of thing. Um, it's hard to say like, how intuitively you would do that, short of like, working through all those principles and starting to recognize all the patterns. In this case, we can just plot it. So I made an actual precise plot of what it looks like, and we'll see that it looks beautifully concave. Um, but yeah, in practice, you would look at second derivatives, eigenvalues of the Hessian. If they're all, if they're all negative, then you have a nice concave shape. Um, there's no, um, no magic recipe short of all those tricks that they teach in the convex optimization classes. So we covered this, we covered this, we covered the log as a monotonic transformation. We can just work with the log instead of the original thing. And then these are the two plots. And again, I just generated those plots. And so we know in this case it's true because these are the precise plots for that objective. Um, but generally, it's going to be true that the log will, the way the log is shaped, it'll essentially help you getting um, maximum likelihood problems often will become better conditioned when you take the log compared to keeping the original. And we said, yeah, remember, convex, concave. Um, convex was the ones we covered before. Any line between two points on the function should be above the function. Concave is the other way around. And that means you have a unique optimum, a unique maximum when you have that. Now, effectively, you can apply this principle to any kind of distribution. We saw just a Bernoulli distribution, up or down outcome for the thumbtack. Um, well, how about multinomial, where it can take on different values, one, two, three, and so forth, up to capital K. Well, we receive some samples, x1 through xm. We can just see, what's the log likelihood of these samples? Um, well, is the log of the product of theta 1 to the power how often we had um, outcome 1, theta 2 to the power how often we had outcome 2, and so forth. Um, and this is what we end up with. And then we can do the math and find that, again, it comes down to counting. How about an HMM? Imagine we have some samples from an HMM where we see both the state x and the observation z at all times. If we have that, we could estimate the model, the dynamics model and the observation model, again, by doing counts. But to do it precisely, we could look at the, I mean, to principally derive this, we can look at these are the models we want to estimate. Let's look at the likelihood of this sequence of observations, state and sensory observation. Write out the likelihood under the joint distribution. Then we can run the kind of optimization. In this case, it can be done in closed form. And we'll find that, indeed, uh, we'll get the counts for uh, conditional of state at time t given state at time t minus 1, and the counts for the conditional of observation given state. It doesn't need to be count-based distributions um, or discrete distributions. Here is a continuous distribution, um, exponential distribution. And exponential is of the form lambda e to the negative lambda x. x can only take on positive values here. And lambda is a choice and it determines how quickly this thing decays versus um, maybe having a, a heavier tail. You get some examples, uh, some samples from the distribution, 3.1, 8.2, 1.7. You can just say, well, what is the probability of each of these samples under this density? Multiply all of them together, or take the log of the product of all of them, and then see what maximizes it. And in this case, lambda is 3 over 13. And that might not have been as easy to read off by just looking at these numbers. You might not have said, oh, it's 3 over 13. You have to do a little bit more math, derive what it is, and you find that um, you know, the equation comes down to 
what you see here, which is some uh, summation of all the values you got in the denominator and then number of samples on top. So this is the general version. Um, your lambda will be, in some sense, the one over the average of the x values that you perceive. Do the same thing for other distributions. How about uniform distribution? What do you think is going to be the outcome there? We can plug in the math, but actually for uniform, it's intuitive. It's much simpler. For uniform, you want to maximize the probability of things you saw, but it has to be uniform. So essentially, you look at the furthest out samples, and it's the last spot where you assign any probability, and everything in between has the same probability. So uniform, the thing that maximizes it would be this thing. When your highest sample is B, your lowest sample is A, you put all the mass between A and B, and it's uniform, it has to be equal. How about Gaussians? You can do the same thing. The math is again the same. We're not going to work through the details, but essentially you say, that's my density function. When I have a sample, or multiple samples, I'm going to maximize the product of the probabilities of these samples, or the sum of the log probabilities of these samples. Log is convenient here because the Gaussian is an exponential in it, and the exponential cancels with the log. And then you work through the math. What do you see? Well, the mean of the Gaussian will be the mean of your samples. That's the maximum likelihood estimate. And the variance parameter of your Gaussian will actually be the empirical variance on your samples. Not too surprising, but formally derived that that is actually the right thing to do to do maximum likelihood estimation for a Gaussian. How about conditional Gaussian? Conditional Gaussian would be where you have a distribution where y is effectively a linear regression of x, but it could be higher dimensional, of course. y equals a0 plus a1x plus noise. That's a linear Gaussian from 1d to 1d. You can get a bunch of samples, work through it, and find the maximum likelihood estimate. What is it going to be? Well, you have to do some math. You'll have a bunch of y's and x's, and this will be the probability of their combination. And then you'll have to look at, OK, what maximizes the product of those probabilities. You do a bunch of math. What comes out? Um, well, you see that effectively you get a least square solution that you have to do to find the parameters of this linear Gaussian. Um, and you will find that the variance, essentially the empirical variance left when estimating y from x based on your best estimate of that linear fit. You can do this for multivariate Gaussians. Again, the math is going to be more hairy as you do this higher dimensional and so forth. But ultimately, it's just very linear math. There's no trickery happening. You're just saying, this is my density. This is my data. Just plug away at it, and out comes some result um, for these kind of distributions in nice closed form. And again, um, conditional multivariate Gaussian, y equals c times x, uh, will come something that looks like least square solution for the c matrix. And then for the covariance matrix, we'll get the empirical covariance on the samples. If you actually want to work through this and get this result, here are some key matrix identities that are useful. Um, otherwise, you probably won't get to this result. And so these are just kind of things that you, at some point, might have derived in a previous class or might have never derived. It might be a surprise right now. Um, but these are true quantities that can come in very handy when doing these multi uh, well, multidimensional derivations with Gaussians, you'll see these tricks will help you out. Probably one of the more intriguing ones is like the gradient of the log of the determinant of a matrix with respect to the entries in that matrix is just the inverse of that matrix. Why does it matter? Well, remember, a multivariate Gaussian has that determinant of the covariance matrix up front, and you'll need to find derivative with respect to the entries in the covariance matrix so you're maximizing the likelihood. And the covariance matrix is a parameter. You try to find the right setting of that whole matrix. You'll have to take derivatives of that thing. And so it turns out, nice closed form for this. If you don't know about this, you might say, oh, well, no closed form possible. It's going to have to do this numerically. But it turns out you can do this in closed form. All right. So how about um, a fully observed linear Gaussian Bayesian filter setting. So you have xt plus 1 equals axt plus but plus wt. zt plus 1 equals cxt plus d plus vt. This is a standard common filter type setting. If everything is observed, you can actually apply maximum likelihood to find a, b, c, d, and the covariance matrix q for w, and the covariance matrix r for v. And that way you have a model of your system. Now, one thing 
you might want to be wary of is that um, sometimes you don't want to just do the maximum likely estimate. You might want to pay attention to something else. So think about um, thumbtack example. Let's say I had five ups. Would you say that the probability of down is zero? Probably you would not, because you might say, well, you never know. It could be down sometimes. And so what that means is that you have some prior information that is not present yet or reflected yet in this data. Data is too small. You have knowledge about the world that you've condensed in this notion that actually sometimes it could fall the other way. It just hasn't happened yet in this experiment. So what you can do, you can introduce a prior explicitly to account for that. You can say, well, my prior is something that some probability on theta, sum on 1 minus theta. I raise them to the same power here, theta times 1 minus theta. It's as if, as if I have seen one time theta come out, which is up 1 times 1 minus theta, which is, which is down. I say, I assume that already happened ahead of time. It hasn't happened yet, but I know it could happen. Let's assume it already happened, and then multiply it in with everything else. Those, those kind of priors are particularly convenient. You come up with a lot of priors. But if you take priors that look like as if you already ran an experiment, you say, assume I already ran the experiment and already saw a few times this, a few times that, then it'll be in the same form factor as the likelihood. And if your derivation for maximum likelihood came out nice in closed form, then this will come out nicely in closed form too, because it'll be the same derivation. You just introduce some fake experiments in the mix, but otherwise everything's the same. For this kind of Bernoulli experiment, this is what it could look like. If you have theta to the power alpha minus 1, 1 minus theta to the power beta minus 1, and then closed form on the right there, you'll see that effectively you add pseudo counts. Alpha minus 1, beta minus 1 pseudo counts as if it has happened but hasn't happened. For some of these choices, by the way, like simple ones you might think about, like the sine 1 here, that's alpha equal 2, beta equal 2. It's like you put as if each side has already happened once. But then in the extreme where alpha and beta are smaller than uh, 1, it's as if you have a negative version of it happening. It's like you think it's not likely both have already happened. It's actually more likely that only one could have happened. And your prior comes out the opposite way, where you see that it puts a lot of weight on either 1 or 0 and not a lot of weight in the middle. That's possible too. You don't have to make it uniform, your prior. It's whatever you think might be likely. And so if you think, and I think it's always going to be the same, but I don't know which side it's going to be, but it's always going to be the same, then you have this alpha beta equals 0 0.5 as a reasonable prior. Um, there's something called Dirichlet distribution, which generalizes this to multinomial variables. But the high level, I mean, there's a lot of symbols here, but high level is the same thing. You're just saying, I pretend I already saw a few experiments. I have pseudo counts for those pretend experiments, and I multiply the probability of those into the likelihood of the actual experiments. Do the same thing for a Gaussian. Um, to make the math work out, you want the prior for your mean of your Gaussian to also be a Gaussian. Because then you have a Gaussian, multiply it with a Gaussian, and we know that's again a Gaussian, and the math will be easy. If you said, well, actually, I think the prior for the mean is that I know it's guaranteed to be positive. It can never be negative. So Gaussian is not a right fit, because a Gaussian, even if I put it out positive, it'll still have something running negative. Well then it's not going to work out as nicely with your math. And you'll probably have to make a trade-off. You might say, you know what, it's fine. I take a Gaussian far enough positive, a small enough variance, there's very little probability mass in the negative, and the math will, will work out cleanly, and that's what I'm going to use. Or you might say, no, I'm going to use some other kind of prior, and now I have to do some numerical optimization to find the maximum likelihood or maximum a posteriori estimate because it's not closed form anymore. So typically, you'll make a trade-off between convenience and precision of the prior that you are imposing on your problem. You can do the same thing for conditional linear Gaussian. You can have priors there. You can have priors over the uh, linear coefficient A. But more generally, you can have priors of the matrix that goes from x to y or from xt to xt plus 1, that matrix A. Um, here are some examples of this worked out. So the slides can just work through what it looks like when you have a prior. So there are some points shown in blue. The true relation is shown in green, so that's what we're hoping to recover, but the data is noisy. So the maximum likelihood estimate under a small amount of data shown in red is actually pretty far off from green. But if we had a prior that, in this case, thinks the coefficients are more likely to be small rather than be large, it'll 
kind of regularize that, and you'll find the black line, which is running closer to horizontal compared to the red line. Now, one thing you also want to do and uh, don't want to forget about is cross-validation. So whenever you have some data and you just fit to the data, it's possible that you're memorizing data, overfitting it, rather than paying attention to the real pattern. We saw this in um, value iteration, sample-based value iteration. You don't want to just overfit a few samples. You want to make sure that you fit your neural net in a way that it generalizes to other data. So typically what you do is you split your data into train and validation data. And then for a range of priors, you can compute the maximum a posteriori. And then see on the validation data which estimate of your maximum a posteriori parameter gives the best performance on the validation data. And that tells you that the prior you used to estimate that was the better prior. That's the same thing in standard neural net learning. You'd say, I put some like, coefficient in front of weight squared because I want to keep the weights small. The coefficient in front of that is a choice. It's a hyperparameter. It's a prior over your weights, effectively, a Gaussian prior over your weights that you're putting in. Same thing would be happening here. You put in a prior, and then in cross-validation, find out which prior yielded the best results. Now, what we covered so far um, assumed in all of the maximum likelihood, the maximum posteriori, that we observe all the data. And we can write out the density or the probability of all that data, and there's no unobserved variables. What we're going to cover next week, Tuesday, because on Thursday we'll do particle filters, but on Tuesday we'll wrap up this part where we'll look at what to do when there's variables we did not observe and still want to do maximum likelihood estimation. That's it for today. Thanks.